everyone, and welcome to this space of St. Paul's United Church here in Paris, Ontario. We are gathered virtually still, but we are in a joyful celebration today of Palm Sunday. We are now entering into Holy Week this coming week, and so I just want to give you a quick couple of updates on some things that are happening for our church. On Good Friday, we are going to gather online. There'll be an online service of worship available for you. And then on Easter Sunday, we're going to try something a little bit different, and the information is going to be coming out to you in our e-blast today as well. And we are going to be inviting folks to come to the front of our church outdoors. We're going to have our cross that we normally have at the front of the church here, and it's going to be available for people to decorate. We do have some butterflies and some flowers and things to decorate the cross with that will be safely available for you to pick up and do that decorating. Or you can feel free to bring uh, fresh flowers or greenery that you think would uh, help make that cross. It's going to be anchored in place just out front. I'm going to be available there during uh, the morning of Easter Sunday to greet people safely and socially distanced and we're going to do that together. There's also going to be a short sunrise service. It's going to be a little bit later uh, than sunrise. We're going to aim for around 8 30, gather and do a short liturgy of Easter Sunday together outdoors in the, the park just across the street from the church building here. And if that's something you're interested in, we are asking for people to pre-register for that so that we can get an idea of who will be coming and make sure that our contact tracing is done as best as we can. So happy Palm Sunday. We gather here joyfully and gratefully online. My name is Reverend Sarah Grady, if I didn't introduce myself before, and if you are joining us for the first time, you are so welcome here to this place. Hello if I see you all the time or if you've joined us before. Hello again. We gather on this, the traditional territory here in Paris of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the neutral people. And we give so much thanks for the work that we continue to do together towards right relationship with our native brothers and sisters. And we give extra thanks on this day for their care for God's creation on this land we call Canada. We also gather today in a light. We are celebrating the joyful and triumphant entry of Jesus Christ into Jerusalem this day. And we celebrate every time we gather that Jesus Christ was named as the light of the world and that we hold this light in this space. May it illuminate our faith and our gathering time together. I now invite us with a call to worship with words that we put away during the season of Lent. And I want to shout from the rooftops, Hosanna, Hosanna, and my favorite one, Hallelujah. Christ the Lord is near. And so we shout again, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hallelujah. Christ the Lord is here. With well-loved songs and waving palms, we celebrate his way from wherever we are situated and whatever time we are watching this on this day. Hosanna, hallelujah, welcome Christ the Lord. Amen. Let us center ourselves now with an opening prayer. Let us pray. 
Oh God, we too welcome Jesus as he comes riding into our hearts and our lives. Help us to join in the celebration so that we may be uplifted and strengthened to join in the events of the coming week, where, we'll, where we will be asked for service and sacrifice in Christ's name, to heal the hurts of a bruised and broken world. Hosanna in the highest, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Amen. turn to the scriptures and I invite you now to please pray with me. God of life, open us now to receive your word, listening for your purpose for our lives and for your truth for our world. Help us to follow your path and show others the way. United in the name of Christ. Amen. We have a very short, simple reading this morning from the book of Zechariah in chapter 9, just verses 9 and 10. And it's the coming ruler of God's people, the prophecy foretold. And it says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you. Triumphant and victorious is he, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. He will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem. And the battle bow shall be cut off. And he shall command peace to the nations. His dominion shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, and for the word of God within us, we say thanks be to God. Please pray with me. Holy One, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. You who are our strength and our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Today I'm actually going to be preaching a sermon that is not mine, but was preached in the Iona Abbey on Palm Sunday in 2004 by Kathy Galloway. And she has this wonderful firecracker sermon for us that I'm going to try and do justice for us today called Palm Sunday is Always Happening. It was a long journey to cover a relatively short distance. Three years it took, beginning with a time of testing, then calling companions, gathering followers, wandering in the Galilee, in a popular ministry which was primarily personal and marked by personal encounters. Occasional times of withdrawal and solitude, away from the crowds, sharing intimacy, trying to teach a bunch of quarrelsome misfits who never really got it, what he was about. And finally, the road to Jerusalem, into the glare of national, political, public debate and conflict. 
And so Jesus came at last to the city after three years wandering the countryside, ministering to the people who flocked to hear him and to seek healing and hope. He set his face toward Jerusalem, knowing that it held great danger for him. And Jerusalem was not a peaceful, prosperous city. It was a city with a history of repeated invasion and attack in a country occupied by a mighty imperial power. It was a city full of rumors and threat and discontent where the poorest suffered most and cried out for a change. It was a city where the pieties of the religious often seemed far removed from the suffering of the people. Does that sound at all familiar to any of you? Like the people of so many cities throughout history, the people of Jerusalem expected deliverance to come through military force. Their own prophets had told the story of conquest so often that they believed in it. In Habakkuk, it says, For I am rousing the Chaldeans, that fierce and impetuous nation, who march through the breadth of the earth to seize dwellings not their own. Dread and fearsome are they. Their justice and dignity proceed from themselves. Their horses are swifter than leopards, more menacing than wolves at dusk, their horses charge. Their horsemen come from far away. They fly like an eagle swift to devour. They all come for violence with faces pressing forward. They gather captives like sand at kings they scoff and of rules they make sport. They laugh at every fortress and heap up earth to take it. Then they sweep by like the wind. They transgress and become guilty. Their own might is their God. But there is always hope. And there is always the promise to keep hope alive in times that test. The promise of a Messiah, a deliverer. We heard that in our Zechariah passage. Many of them looked for a great leader, a warrior hero to save them. Some of them, as the rumor spread like wildfire through Jerusalem, thought that Jesus might be that leader. Now, clearly, Jesus was aware of that. This was no attempt to slip quietly into the city without anyone noticing. The way he came, the time and manner of his coming, all referred back to the scriptural prophecies, notably that of Zechariah that we just heard. Jesus came to Jerusalem, and he did enter it humbly, riding on a donkey. There is little doubt that the crowds could see that Jesus' entry was in light of this prophecy. Because a a donkey was not the customary mount of a warrior or a king. It was the mount of a non-combatant, a civilian, a merchant, or perhaps even a priest. Zechariah saw the Messiah as the Prince of Peace, and this was the way Jesus chose to announce himself in Jerusalem. I will remove the chariots, the war chariots from Israel, and take the war horses from Jerusalem. The bows used in battle will be destroyed. Your king will make peace among nations. So said Zechariah. The Prince of Peace indeed. But it was a pretty confrontational way to arrive, wouldn't you say? There was a mighty challenge to appear making the most audacious and blasphemous claim, trailing a vagabond army of followers from the north into a holy city that was occupied territory of the greatest power on earth at that time. It was a challenge to the Pharisees who did not want anything to upset the Romans and to threaten the Pharisees' freedom to practice their own religion. It was a challenge to Herod who was already very confused about what was going on. It was a challenge to the military, who didn't want their job of controlling a city and a country made any more difficult by yet another population insurrection. And it was a challenge, or at least a question, to the ordinary people of Jerusalem. This is who I say I am. Who do you say I am? Do you remember that from a few weeks ago in our scriptures? When Jesus asked his disciples that question, 
because this entry into Jerusalem was the most political act of Jesus's life. And yet, all of the themes in their different ways miss the point of this public challenge, really. The Pharisees, the scholars, and the theorists, as they were, did not know how to respond to this man who refused to debate or argue with them. In fact, he hardly spoke to them, but countered their intellectualizing by doing things which, infuriatingly, were hard to argue with and left them feeling foolish and exposed. The military authorities know how to put down armed uprising. No one knew better, but they didn't have any strategy to deal with someone who offered nonviolence to anyone and discouraged his followers from it, but still posed a threat to public order. How were they supposed to deal with this challenger who had arrived in their midst? And the people Oh my goodness, the people, they crowded into the streets of the city to welcome them. You remember those crowds? I think we all miss crowds. There were so many of them, particularly the poor ones who made up the majority that wanted peace. They wanted an end to occupation and bread in their stomachs, a better life. It's what people have wanted since the dawn of time, a better life. So of course they welcomed Jesus. The crowds are fickle. We've seen it happen in our own modern times. The mood swings and people tend to follow a crowd. A crowd is a funny thing. It loves a spectacle. It comes out for celebrations and carnivals and it joins in with enthusiasm and it can be in good natured fun but it comes out equally for death, for funerals and wakes, and stands silently or weeps or prays. Sometimes the crowd comes out in solidarity to make a point, to demonstrate a feeling. But a crowd can also turn angry. It can become threatening, it can get nasty, it can do terrible things. What makes the mood swing in a crowd that has been part of a joyful and welcoming celebration swing into a baying mob? What is it that tips the balance between a homecoming and a hanging? What is the energy that races like lightning through a crowd and causes the good to turn evil? Was it when they realized the peace was not going to come after a great, bloody, conquering battle? That there was going to be no Operation Freedom, or that for Jesus, peace was not an outcome but a way, and a difficult way? Last week I summed up the challenges and the ways that Jesus called us to live our life, the choices that he was drawing us to make in our own lives and in our own journeys. And I mentioned last week, it would be difficult. Did this crowd realize this? That what Jesus had offered in that Sermon on the Mount was not going to lead them down the easy path, but the tough road? Did they turn on him because he refused to defend himself with violence? Did they turn on him because they realized that if they decided to stand alongside him, they would also stand out and become visible that they would be going against the majority, or at least those in power. Did they turn on him when he challenged them to make choices that went against all that conventional wisdom that might lead them into danger? Was it when he confronted them with what they knew about themselves but preferred to attribute to others? Or was it when they guessed that fullness of life had to go through loss and emptiness first. Their suspicions were well founded. Jesus' friends did find themselves on the losing side. They had to give up their quiet lives. They had to give up what security and status they had to be a follower of his way. They had to give up their previous identity. Those fishermen became disciples. They had to let go of their past, their family attachments, all of the things that had made them who they were. And they had to give up their prejudices and preferences, some of them even their lives. Jesus was a lightning conductor for the crowd in Jerusalem. 
During the last year or so, I have been missing crowds. I've been missing them. And I'm sure all of you have too. The crowd we used to sit amongst in the sanctuary on a Sunday morning or a special service of worship like Christmas or Good Friday or Easter. There was a mood that rippled through that crowd in Jerusalem that would have been visible in these cities and the challenges. Do you remember Palm Sundays gone by? Because Palm Sunday is always happening. And as we have moved through our lives, we've often been confronted by the challenge of that different way of being that is associated with Palm Sunday. Yes, it's a joyful celebration. That's most often what we celebrate. And the way that we do that is with the waving of the palm branches and usually the children marching around the sanctuary. Jesus was making a political statement on that first Palm Sunday. It was a challenge to a different way of being. And the way of peace that he was offering in that time does not shrink from conflict but refuses violence. The way does not theorize but engages with the real needs of suffering people. The way that sees the people who are overlooked and not counted. The way of self-offering was the way that Jesus brought with him that day. We too are called to walk the way. And this week, as we walk with Jesus through Holy Week, I pray that we too would have the courage for these challenges that are part of all of our lives. And I think these challenges need some prayer, so let us pray. Holy One, our Lord Jesus Christ, you entered the city as a poor man, not in style, but simply. Yet you caused uproar and questions everywhere. You drew the expectations of a hungry crowd and brought buried conflicts to the light. May we who are sometimes swayed by the crowd's approval, who often avoid conflict for the fear of its cost to us, hold fast to the gospel of peace and justice and follow faithfully in the ways of compassion and solidarity with those who are poor and excluded, wherever it may lead us. Amen.
offer a blessing now for the gifts offered to this place for the mission work of God's church through uh, how we offer ourselves here at St. Paul's United Church. I am grateful for all gifts offered, gifts of talent and time as well as treasure. So let us pray that blessing upon those gifts now. Bless, O oh God, the gifts offered to this place and bless our desire to participate in seeking justice, hope and peace. Accept the gifts we offer as a sign of our love for you, for our neighbors, and may these gifts be used for the mission work of your church. Amen. And now we're going to turn to prayers for God's people and God's world, and today we have a musical response that Jennifer is going to help me out with. It's from the beautiful community of Taze, and the words are, nothing can trouble, and I'll have them up on the screen for you. And each time we're going to sing these words, we'll hear the response, and let us raise our voices in praise to you. for suffering endured for 
grief absorbed, questions unanswered, promises forgotten, and loneliness rejected. We spread out our palm branches and cloaks down before you now, grateful for all the signs of your goodness among us, and hopeful for the good news that Jesus brought as we join our voices together in this song of praise to you. My friends, upside down glory has been revealed in a leader crowned in thorns, in a leader who relies not on force but the power of love in him. The grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all. Unaware no longer, we are willing to follow the light of this leader. May upside down become right side up. May we gasp at the glory revealed in Jesus. May we move from our old ways to revel in the promise of new life. And may we comf confront injustice and the light the world with renewed vision. And may God bless us all this day and always. As our worship ends, let our service now begin. Go in peace, my friends. Oh. 